Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for this wonderful place and this wonderful day, Lord. Just to be able to receive your word here this morning is truly a blessing. Mm-hmm. Father, we ask that you just clear away all those things that are clouding our minds and clouding our heart and just open our ears, Father, so that we can receive your word this morning as you would have us receive it. Have it touch those, Lord, who need to be touched with your th- with this specific message today, Lord. And we just, just raise you up in prayer and we love you and praise you uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, with our highly windy service last week, I wasn't even sure if it would record well, but it did come out for the YouTube, so we're thankful, even though it was shortened by blowing tents and things that, you know, flew away, but uh, we're grateful no one got hurt, and we're just thanking the Lord that uh, we get to be back, and now we have a nice breeze. Who's praying for our AC right now? You're doing a great job. Just keep doing that, and uh, keep it right at this, right at this. <laughs> When you're on a beach, you have to trust the Lord for the thermostat. The, I never thought of that before. You know, when we were in the building, you know, when you wh- when it gets too warm, you just motion to one of the deacons in the back, go to the thermostat and swing it down, and and you and you don't realize that, you know, out on the beach, we're we're it's we really have to grow in faith sometimes to trust the Lord for everything, the weather, the whole surroundings, the the gathering of people that he'll bring, the ones that will be even on the walking track across the way. There's a gentleman I ran into in the in KTA who said he couldn't wait for the next p- part of the sermon. And I said, I didn't see you at church. And he goes, oh, no, Pastor, I was over there on the walking track going around. I couldn't go to the far end because your voice doesn't carry down there, but, it, but if I made little circles. So he was doing Brody's right over there. And I'll listen to the sermon, and he's like, I can't wait to the ne- hear the next one. I said, okay, this is, um, y- you know, it's neat that the Lord can let us be encouragement to even the guys doing their jogging this morning, passing by, that maybe they'll get to. Let's just pray like Jesus would always say, let those that have an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And today we're in a sweet part of the Scriptures, Galatians chapter 6 and We've been talking about from the end of chapter 5, you'll remember the last two verses says, if we walk by the Spirit, then it says, then let us, uh, I'm sorry, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And let us not become boastful. This is the last two verses of chapter 5. Don't be boastful, don't be challenging one another and envying one another. And we went over verse 1, that's all I got through last week of chapter 6. Brethren, he said, if any of you even, even if any of you is caught in a trespass or a sin, it says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of what? Gentleness. Gentleness. And, uh, and, and, and it says, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. When it comes to, we went in detail over the idea of helping someone caught in a trespass. We have to do that you, you can, how many of you have friends that are, are, are trapped in a certain vice, a certain sin that just, you can tell they're, they're, they're stuck in it. They can't, they've got an addiction and they can't break free. And you, your heart is compassionate. You want them, you even pray, maybe it's one of your family members. How many here have a family member you've prayed for to be freed from an addiction that they just, they're, they're stuck in it? Well, this is what the Bible tells us to do. It says, go and and do this in a spirit of gentleness. You can't be harsh when you're trying. And this is so un-Italian to, to me. I mean, it's uh, unnatural. Because I, I am not wired to come in gently and say, hey, straighten up. I'm used to straighten up, you know. The, the, the NCIS guy I told you about, Gibbs, when Denozo is out of line, his understudy, he just tacks him on the back of the head, you know, Gibbs slap him, I call it. That, that seems like what, what I would want to do. But then the Lord used this verse to ask me, is that what you want them to do to you? Remember, we're supposed to love one another and do unto others as we would have them what? Do unto us. And this is something that, it's a, it's a battle for us because sometimes our flesh, Paul says is at war. And in the book of Romans, he gives a great analogy. He says, our flesh with its desires are opposed. They're in opposition 
to the spirit. Anyone can give an amen to that, that your flesh fights against your spirit? Paul said, with my mind, I serve the Lord, you know, and um, with my body, my flesh tries to get in charge. You know, I call it fleshing out when the flesh starts trying to rule over your body and, and, and your actions. And we want to do what, what Paul is writing to the churches of Galatia. We want to live by the Spirit, not just in words, but he says, if we say we want to live by the Spirit, let us what? Walk by the Spirit. Let us do this spiritual journey that we have as a day-to-day walking in the spirit you know the men that come to our men's prayer meeting we end many a time praying lord we ask not that we stop praying now at the end of our meeting but this is just the beginning of our day of prayer that we will continue to walk in prayer as and, and intercede for those whoever you put in front of us those that you bring to our remembrance that this is just the start of our prayer time that we can continue to walk and be led this is my prayer that the men, if I get the men, the women, they're so pff, easy. The men, if I get the men to walk after the Spirit of God, truly become Spirit-filled, Spirit-led men that listen to the leading of the Holy Ghost, do you know how much easier it makes it for the gals? Amen? amen? Lots of amens. <laughs> see? That's an easy amen. But see, this is what... Paul has been addressing, and he says, he, he knows that this is something that is obvious because of Paul, the, the, this epistle here to the churches of Galatia. This is not to just one church. This is to the churches in a whole region. Galatia was a region there, north of the Mediterranean Sea, that inland, just up a little north, that was, um, well, it, it encompassed, uh, the, the historians say, about 10 different churches. So this is a letter to 10 different churches that they would circulate, send it to one, pass it to the next fellowship, pass it to the next one. And unbelievably, these people had trouble with walking not after the Spirit. Can you imagine that, a church not in the Spirit? A church that was doing good works, but actually in the flesh. And Paul has to address that. He says, you, you guys, you, you become boastful. You become challenging one another and envying one another. You're, you're, those are, by the way, those are attributes of the flesh or the spirit. The flesh. He says, you guys, are, you're, you're in the flesh. Knock it off. You've got to get in the spirit. And so he tell, he, we, we went over how we go to one brother or sister caught in a trespass gently. Like, like Jesus said, like we're taking a speck out of their eye. You know, we have to do that with gentleness when we remove a speck from someone's eye. But before we did that, we s went over last week. What did we have to do first? Make sure we didn't have a beam or a log hanging out of our own eye. You can't, you might recognize that speck of sawdust and you go, that's pine. I'm sure that's pine. And you're like, how do you know? Because I got a pine tree hanging out of my eyeball, you know, because you have that very sin in your life. You recognize it in someone. It's, it's funny how... Well, my wife, she, she used an analogy she was telling me because her parents both were heavy chain smokers her whole life. And they got really mad at her when she would. They, in, in Arizona, you have houses that are closed in uh, from the outside air most of the time because of the varying temperatures. It's either too cold out or too hot. And so you use your air conditioning in the summer and your, your heating in the winter. And the house is all sealed up. But when you're sealed in with two chain smokers that never stop, morning, noon, night, just from the moment they're up till, the, till they go to bed, the walls of the house inside actually yellowed. Whale. Whale. Wait, 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 where? Oops, am I blocking the view of the camera? I'll move over here so I can. So I'll teach over here now. Oh, full breach. <laughs> For you on the radio that don't believe us, check out the YouTube of today's sermon. And you will get to see the whale to the left of the rock just came completely out. Do that again, whale. There we go. Thank you. We worked on that. And Q. One more, maybe? <laughs> that was, I like how the Lord just winks at us. Yay. Lord, you are too good. 
We give you all the praise. It says all creation testifies of the glory of the Lord. And uh, we, we don't worship whales here. We worship the creator of the whale. But uh, you didn't know you are getting a free whale show with the word, did you? It's a beautiful thing. Another one. Keep going there. So listen to my voice, but watch the whale, okay? We'll just continue. So in my mother-in-law's house, the walls were stained with um, tobacco. It just yellowed the walls. And my wife used to put little um, dryer sheets, another one, over the vents of her room to try to get that nicer smell from the, the smoke. And she used to get um, scolded about that. And then um, my, my mother-in-law went on a trip with some Christian women that had been praying for her from her church. And they took a trip, and I don't remember, was it, was it on the plane or in the car? When, or they drove. While they were driving, they were going to stop at a rest area for her to, you know, have a smoke or whatever. And she took some puffs of the cigarette, and she got really sick. She's like, this is terrible. And, uh, and so she came in and asked the ladies, have you been praying for me to quit smoking? And they said, yes, of course. Y you know, they love her, and, but they could see it was damaging her. She'd been doing it f f for many, since many, many years. And so had her husband. And so, you know, we're talking two to three packs a day, I believe, was their average of, of smoking that they went through and uh, each. And so I remember them getting cartons of, you know, the big cartons all the time. And, and I just, these women prayed out of love for my mother-in-law to quit smoking. And she came and she went, you guys have been praying for me, haven't you? This tastes disgusting. I'm, and she put it down and didn't go back to it. And then this is a part that I have come to learn that when, when you quit uh, or are delivered from a vice, it's amazing how you can become the Nazi <laughs> for, 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 for the ones that, that are still in the vice because her husband was still smoking. And she, she was trying to bite her tongue to not say anything. She was doing her best. And he started actually going, my father-in-law went outside to smoke. And because she wasn't smoking with him now, and it felt uh, that was really good. I even got to see the splash all the way out. Thank you, Lord. Woohoo! So, my father-in-law actually, I believe, was it Valentine's Day? Wh what was the her birthday? For her fiftieth birthday, he didn't tell her. He quit too. And but he had been going outside to smoke, so she didn't notice. And it's so funny that when, when you know, you get delivered from these things, and then time passes that. My mother-in-law actually remarked to me that she had some friends that had also quit smoking. But they were the true Nazis of, you know, when it came to, you know, hey, we quit, you need to quit, you know. And, I mean, they were demanding that they – and what is it with us when we, when we get freed from something, the Lord frees us, shouldn't we, in a spirit of gentleness, want to help someone else to be freed? Not, not the, hey – you jerk, you need to be freed too because I'm free now. It, that's not the ad. But l let me assure you, how many of you have known people like this that they get freed from a certain sin and all of a sudden they're just going to let everyone else make sure they're not doing that sin and they just go after them? Well, this is what Paul had run into in the whole region of the churches of Galatia. They had the same problem. There were certain people getting freed and instead of having the spiritual outlook of their freedom the the rejoicing of thanks lord for freeing me they all of a sudden are demanding everyone else join them but not in this gentle spirit the that spirit that the holy ghost puts in us to help someone but in a demanding nazi way you gotta you stop that and and i'm better than you now and it says they became boastful challenging one another now Today, we're going to continue what Paul says next in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, where he's going to talk about, and by the way, if you're not familiar with this part of our wiring, is it wired into us to boast? 
about things. I mean, just whatever. How we're doing our day. I mean, it, 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 let me show you something. Paul goes on. He says, be careful that you would make sure you res you restore someone in this spirit of gentleness. And I d I'm sorry, I forgot to finish verse 1. He said, and so that you, uh, he says, each one of you, when you do this, looking to yourself. He says, so that you too will not be what? Tempted. If you don't do it gently, Paul says, you're going you're gonna to face a temptation yourself. God will, you know, Jesus said, any way that you judge someone, what will happen to you? That's the way you get judged. So as far as I'm concerned, I don't judge any of you. Because I am not interested in getting judged. There's only one in 1 Corinthians 11. They're uh, uh, past uh, about verse 23 to 28 there in that section that we're allowed to judge. Who's that? When we take communion, we, we talk about this. Yourself. Examine yourself. Well, that idea that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he also wrote to the churches of Galatia. And he said, watch out. Do it gently or else you're going to be tempted. And then he says in verse 2, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks that he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting. In regard, it says, to himself alone and not in regard to another. These guys... Well, Paul had recognized they had, they had this bragging going on, but it wasn't in regard to what God was doing in their lives. It was, it was what they were forcing others to do in their spiritual circle. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to read ahead just so I can read to you the end of the chapter, but I reserve the right to come back next week. I'm just, I'm just going to pass through so you get it in context. But I want to show you this. He says, he says, for each one of us will bear his own burden, his own load. Now, the one who has taught the word, he said, is to share all good things with him who teaches him. I'll come back to that next week. And do not be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this he shall what? He'll reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap cor corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Now, let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time, we will reap if we do not grow weary. This is a part where we need to hang in there because when, I, when you sow something, you know, like we spoke of last week about the, the plants, when you, when you plant the seed from a mango tree or a, or, or, or a papaya, well, it was two weeks ago, or papaya tree, it takes time for it to grow and produce fruit. And he says, just don't lose heart in doing good. In due time, there's a right time that, 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 that you're going to get to reap. If you don't grow weary. Now this is one of the, why does the Bible say don't grow weary? Because we do. <laughs> you know, like, don't judge one another. Why does it say that? Because we do. Th these things that tell us what not to do are there because, well, we do them. But I love the Bible because the Bible isn't a bunch of don't do, don't do, don't do. It tells you what not to do and gives you what? what to do okay it gives you the and and those of you that have grown up with negative people around you they're always telling you what not to do they can wear you out that's why i love this scripture it it points out what not to do but it gives you the answer what to do the the the, the actual cure to that problem so that you're not stuck in it well here he says so then while we have opportunity what should we do let us do good to all people, especially to those that are of the household of faith. And he said, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Paul, you guys might remember from another passage in the scripture, said he, he bore them witness that they would have plucked out their own eyes and given them to him because he had such trouble seeing. So at the end of this letter, he's, he usually dictated his, his epistles. One of the other guys was writing the things down. But here he's picked up the pen himself. And he's saying, look, I'm writing to you with my own hand. And those that desire to make a good showing in the flesh, will they try to compel you to be circumcised simply that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. 
For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they might boast in your flesh. In other words, they want to see you do the spiritual requirements, even if they don't do it. You know, they're, they, that, that was the Jewish way. You know, let's, let's get those guys to follow the rules, but we don't even do it. Well, he said, for those that are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves. And he says, they desire you to, to be circumcised. So more whales. Woohoo! Over my head. I'll just stay here and let you, you move out there and film it if you need to. This is so great. It's going to be so fun to show our friends on the mainland. They're going to be just. Uh, by the way, all you ones on the mainland, you are invited to come personally and sit in the chairs and run your toes through the sand and enjoy the, um, the nice whale show with us. But if you can't, we'll, we'll ship it to you in the, through, through the YouTube and let you enjoy it. It, you know, it's been a really neat blessing to have people write to me and say, you don't understand, we're snowed in in Alaska. We, we are like bunkered in. We won't, we, we're, we're stuck. And this is like a ray of sunshine to us to just watch you guys and to hear the word. And, and so praise the Lord. I rejoice in that. This is so cool. Well, now Paul says, but may it never be, these guys want to boast in your flesh, but may it never be that I would boast in your flesh instead he says except that i would boast in one thing what does he say he would boast in i would boast in the cross of the lord jesus christ through which the world has been crucified to me and i to the world if i'm going to boast about anything paul says it's going to be the cross of jesus now interestingly enough to the church at corinth in second corinthians Paul actually wrote that boasting is necessary. But he said it's not always profitable. It is part of the, the necessity of sharing that we actually boast. But, but Paul, he had recognized that there's a lot of men that want to boast in themselves and in their own accomplishments. And they don't boast, like he said, in the cross of Christ. And so if you would turn with me, let me show you this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul had learned some things about this boasting. I think maybe he had boasted about some things and it backfired. This is my guess. I'm going to ask him when I get to heaven. But from, from the, what is contained in the writings of the scriptures, it's pretty obvious he had some uh, refining in this area. Because he wrote in first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he said in verse 30, If I have to boast, I will boast in what pertains to what? My weakness. What? I, I, who boasts in their weakness? Yeah, I'm weak. Bragging. I'm weak. I'm weak. <laughs> I don't know how boast. I didn't learn boasting like that. We were always boasting in, in our strengths. You know, I can do this or I can do that. I mean, as a young man, that was, the, that was the whole thing. You get around other young men and it's, well, I can do this trick on the skateboard. Well, I can do it better. And, oh, watch me. And, you know, you never said, well, I can't do it. I'm terrible. I boast in my weakness. That, uh, what? They would have looked at you like, you're a loser. But Paul, I want you to pay attention. This is probably one of the coolest things. If you have to Remember, if you're reading something in the Bible and you're perplexed, don't quit. I, I, too many people have picked up the book, read a verse and got perplexed and then set it down and went, it's too confusing. And I tell them, wait, you didn't read it in context. You didn't even, you only read one verse. You can't do that. You can't just pluck it out of the middle of the, of the passage it's in. You, you want 2020 spiritual vision? I tell the kids, go back up 20 verses and read ahead 20 verses. And you'll get a, a really good overview of how, what's the context it's being written in. And, and Paul, Paul had, well, if you back up 20 verses, he's talking about how he had served the Lord and, and gone through some great persecutions for what he had done in Christ. And, he, and he, he explains that there are people that were deceiving the Christians. And he said in verse 16, I'll just back up. This is only 14 verses, but I had need to go farther the other way today to show you something. He said again, 
Let no one think me foolish, but if you do, receive me even as foolish, so that I might boast a little. Now here's his boasting. What I'm saying is, I'm not saying as the Lord would, but as in foolishness, in this confidence of boasting. Since many boast according to the flesh. He said, I'll boast also. For if you, being so wise, tolerate the foolish gladly, and, and you tolerate it if, if anyone enslaves you, or anyone devours you, or anyone takes advantage of you, or anyone exalts himself, uh, 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 and anyone hits you in the face, he said, to my shame, I must, I must say that I've been weak by comparison. But in whatever respect anyone else is bold, I speak in foolishness. He said, I am just as bold myself. Verse 22, he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Everything these guys, you know, would boast about back then in the Jewish culture. Check, check, check. He, he fit the bill. He said, and are they servants of Christ? He said, I speak as if insane. I more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. He said, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. You know what they, the, the beating of, of 40 save one it was called. 39 lashes. That was the, they had this down to an art when they would beat a man within one stripe. Just one more lashing and, and they could kill you. It was, it was the number of, of punishment to death. 40. But 40 save one. Keep back just one. We're going to beat you within what? One lash of killing you and leave you alive to feel the pain. He had received that five times. Then he goes on and says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Then, and remember that, that incident, they stoned him to death. Well, they thought he was dead. I, I believe he actually was. They threw him over the wall, it says, into the city dump. And the Spirit of the Lord told him what? Get up. You're not done. I mean, poor guy. <laughs> they taught a rough day. They beat you to death, throw you into the trash heap, it was called. And he, and the Lord goes, sorry, Paul, you don't get that, you didn't get out of there that easy. Get up. And he, got, he continues on. Three times he says, I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. Now listen, I've been out deep sea fishing at night here, spent the whole night out there, eight miles away from shore. It's pitch black. There's not any lights. The light that you see is from putting it overboard with our little float light that we had. And all of these interesting critters come out at night that it's spooky. I mean, we had, we had killer whales visit us in the night, rub up against the boat. And, uh, and they're, they're not that big. The pilot whales are much smaller than the one you just saw jumping. But they are big enough that they rub your 30-foot your boat and it, you know, they're bigger than the boat. So they have no trouble when they rub you uh, e e up against it, just tilts your whole boat. You can see that they could easily capsize you. And I'm thinking this guy was out there shipwrecked. I'm in the boat. I'm okay. I'm at least, you know, hanging on inside. But, but floating around in the water with no lights, no some. Did they have underwater flashlights back then? <laughs> you know, I've done night dives with the manta rays and, and you know, but I got this mega light. I mean, big. These he's out there in the dark with creepy stuff all around. Squid, if you've ever seen how fast a squid is when they come zipping in. He's out there a night and a day shipwrecked. He says, I've been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, danger from Gentiles. Dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, and dangers amongst, oh, he put this one in the list. Amongst what? False brethren. They're the most dangerous, I think. He said, I've labored in hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food and in cold exposure. Apart from such external things, there's the daily pressure of, on me of concern for all the churches. He said, who is weak without me being weak? Who is led into sin 
without my intense concern. This is the heart of a pastor. He cared if somebody was being led astray. He was intensely concerned for them. He said, if I have to boast, verse 30, this is the verse I just started with, I will boast of what pertains to my what? My weakness. The God and the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. He said in Damascus, the Enthrarch under Arda, uh, Arda, no, I'm sorry, Ara, Aratas. I get that one. I keep wanting to say Artas, but it's Aratas. The, the king was guarding the city of the D Damascenes in order to seize me. And I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall so that I escaped his hands. He said, boasting is, the, oh, I'm sorry, this is chapter 12, verse 1. Boasting is what? Necessary. Though it is not always profitable. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. If I'm going to boast, let me tell you about a revelation about the Lord. He says, I know a man who 14 years ago, whether he was in the body I do not know, or if he was out of the body, I do not know. God knows, he says. But such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Now remember, in their culture, the first heaven is what we call our atmosphere. The second heaven is what we call our, our galaxy, the stars. And the third heaven, as it's referred to in Hebrew, is what? The throne of God, where God lives, where he dwells. Now, some people say, well, but how far away is God's throne from, like, is it in our atmosphere or is it in the stars? Is it? Well, when Jesus, in the book of Acts, he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Do you remember the guys were standing there watching and the angels, it says the sky opened. I'm not so sure that the third heaven is real far away. Because it says that the sky opened and Jesus ascended to the Father. And the men... Those guys were the apostles, the A-team. They stood there going, with their mouths open, gum showing and everything. And they're like, <gasps> and the angel said, why are you stand gawking? Don't you know this Jesus, what you have just seen going this way to the, to the Father? We'll, we'll do what? We'll return in like manner. And when we read in the book of Revelation, it says, the sky will rent. Like a, like, I tell the kids, like a, a curtain peeling back. And then we'll see him coming with his myriads, myriads of saints, thousands upon thousands on flying horses coming back to this earth. I, I go, his first coming, it was humble. You know, a baby born in a manger, laid in a manger. But his second coming, we read about that. By the way, if you didn't know this, a lot of Jews believe that Christ will come. They just don't like the first coming descriptions in their scriptures. They like the second coming. They want the guy who's going to come in power and deliver. You know, they, that guy they're into. They're really like, oh, we're in for him. But if their heart's not right with him, they're going to be shocked. So Paul says, I know of a guy who got caught up into the third heaven. And he says, I, I actually don't know whether he was in his body or out of his body. It was just the experience was so, you know, he, was, he got to see well, it says, he was caught into paradise, verse 4 says, and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. He said, on behalf of such a man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do, for if I do wish to boast, he says, I would not be foolish, for, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Because, he says, of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. How many of you heard of the Paul's thorn in the flesh? He says, I had this thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, he says, I employed the Lord three times that it might leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in what? In power, right? No. 
power is perfected in weakness. And most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ might dwell with me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distress, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, you guys have heard this verse, right? Then I am what? Strong. Now, how can he make such a claim? When I am weak, who? He said, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Why is he able to say I am strong? Whose strength is he relying on? Jesus. When he is weak, in his weakest state, and I found this many a times, uh, I, I feel like some weeks getting ready for the sermon, I get beat up. I'm like, Lord, this has been a rough week. I am exhausted. I, I just, you don't know this, but I'll be like telling Aaron, Aaron, man, I just pray this comes out even intelligible, that, that they can understand. I hope, the, I hope this sermon makes sense, because I know the part, but I am, I, my, my head feels like scrambled eggs. You know, I'm just, I'm, I feel like I'm in a fog and I'll get done with the sermon. I'll look at him, Aaron, did, could you follow that? He's, oh, it's really good. That's one of your best sermons ever. Wally, dear Wally Dolan, that turkey, he used to pray that I'd have a rough Saturday night. <laughs> Even Friday night. He said, if you have a bad Friday night and a Saturday night, it's going to be a great message. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, every time. When you're weak, that's when you're strong. That's when the Holy Ghost takes over and it's not you. And I'm like, I hate you. I mean, <laughs> I'm supposed to love you, but I'm not liking you right now. You're the one that's praying I have a bad Friday night and Saturday night? Man, I didn't get any sleep this weekend. And so I said, okay, because the, the, the message will be great. And Paul Paul came to understand this truth, that when he was weak, that's when the Lord's strength came through. That's when the Lord did these mighty things. And when people tried to credit it to him, he's like, look, it wasn't me. I'm messed. I, I'm weak. If you, if you got anything good out of that, praise the Lord. It's all the credit goes to him because it wasn't me. My tank was empty. Now, Paul had to learn this. In fact, some people suspect that the guy he's talking about that had the vision 14 years earlier that he talks about in third person, I don't know whether the fella had, was in his body or out of his body, but he did get to be caught up to see things in paradise and stuff he can't even... Ex put. Well, the word in Greek is it's inexpressible. It's, it's not even able to be put into words. He's all brag about that guy. Because that's pretty cool. I mean, anyone here would volunteer for a little, you know, being caught up into heaven just for a preview? Like, Lord, you know, just to help my faith this week, could you just let me have a glimpse of your heavenly throne? Who, who would be up for that? I'll go. Yeah. He says, but the problem was, he said, because of the surpassing revelations that he received, he said there was a, a thorn given to him in the flesh a messenger of Satan that would buffet him to keep him humble. And he says, how many times did he ask the Lord to remove that thorn? Three times. And this is where it's really interesting. I know this really messes with some people's heads. Th th they, they're like, that just doesn't compute. You mean he asked God three times to remove the thorn? And I mean, Satan is hassling him. Why wouldn't God remove that thorn? Because there's something about a man that sometimes God has to keep him humble to make him truly useful. And the Lord, in humbling Paul, he said, even, even just the name change for this fellow. He used to be called Saul. Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Saul in Hebrew is a very desirable name. It actually means desirable. For If you named a young man Saul, you're saying, in today's vernacular, GQ, handsome, you know, like really desire. You're, you're setting this kid up for a really good, healthy self-esteem. You're, you're saying, this is, and that's the name he, wa he was given his whole life. I'm Saul. 
man, I got it together. But when the Lord had a little meeting with him on the road there, remember, it was a road to Damascus? I mean, Damascus. I, sometimes I switch it. It's a bad slip in my brain. Damascus. On the way to Damascus, when he had that letter in hand and was out to kill the Christians, and the Lord packed him. He, he, the Lord gib slapped Paul. His Saul was his name at the time. He smacked him, and it says, and, and blinded him for three days. And for those three days, well, he began with, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecuteth who? Me. Now, for those of you who don't know the story in the Bible, Jesus had already died and rose again and ascended to the, to the right hand of the Father. So he's already in heaven. But he takes a little detour from the throne, comes down, and visits with this fellow who is persecuting the church, the early church. And he takes him to task, and he says, why do you persecute me? It says that he, the Lord appeared as a light brighter than the sun at high noon. Paul, or Saul, was blinded. And he would then be led by the hand, blind, into town, where for the next three days he gets personal, personal seminary notes from Jesus. Jesus told him what? Does anyone know what the topic was they went over for the next three days from the book of Acts? How much he would, what? Say it again. How much he was going to suffer now for, th for the name of the Lord. <laughs> for those of you that have been taught a gospel where come to Jesus, everything will be perfect. You'll have no, life will be a bed of roses with no thorns. Let me tell you that is a false gospel. Because if I taught you that, that and by the way, that gospel has, um, well, well, it's not a gospel. That non-gospel that, that false doctrine has set sail through the churches over the over church history many a time. And in the wake of that of that ship passing, there's always a bunch of shipwrecked people's faith. Because okay, if I tell you you're gonna have it all easy, nothing bad's gonna happen, everything's gonna be great. Just come to Jesus. Every your life will be perfect. And then you have a bumpy rocky road in life. And you start thinking, well, maybe I don't have enough faith, or I don't, maybe Jesus doesn't love me, or Jesus said, in this world, let me, let me see if you know this scripture from the Gospels, John. In this world, ye shall have, John 14, what? Tribulation. Tribulation. But be of good cheer, he says, I have what? Overcome the world. I'm going to tell you the truth. Jesus started off Saul's journey of faith with three days of intense seminary from Jesus himself saying, listen, buddy, you've been killing Christians. You've been arresting them. You've been having them beaten. You've been doing all this bad stuff. Guess what you're going to endure? Remember, don't judge lest you be what? Judged. God is fair in everything. This guy's intro to Jesus was, you're going to suffer, buddy. And by the way, your name is not right. Desirable. We got to change that from Saul. We're going to make it Paul. From now on, you'll be called Paul, which, if you know Hebrew, Paul means little or small. You're too full of yourself, Mr. GQ. We're going to knock you down a few notches and put you no more Saul, but now Paul. What's your name? Little. From a guy that was from, you know, desirable to little. It's a, uh, Jesus was hitting him right where he was at. You know, like, hey, you're too full of yourself. We got, and, and you're too full of boasting about yourself. We're going to fix that. I'm going to show you that when you're weak, that's when you're really strong. When you don't have the strength, maybe he was about to drown out there in the, in the depths of the sea during the night. And he's going under. And the Lord, right in that last gasp of breath, brought him back up. When he'd thrown over the wall, having been stoned, th throwing rocks at his head. I can't imagine, you know, you, you wake up in the garbage heap and you got just, you know, big old lumps all over from guys throwing rocks at you, killing you. And not, not only that, just chucking you over the wall into the garbage heap. And the Lord goes... Not done. 
Get up. This is, by the way, if you ever wonder why I have a confidence when it comes to the days what we live our lives here. We don't know how many days we have. Moses said in Psalm 90, Lord, if I live 70, 80 years, 90, due to strength, he said, my life is but a vapor and I fly away. It's just, that's where we sing that song, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. That comes from that psalm. But Moses says, but Lord, teach me to number, verse 12 of Psalm 90, teach me to number my days that I might present to thee a heart full of wisdom. Lord, let me make the most of the days you do give me. Let me present to you a full, the Hebrew word is a full accounting. Like, like I, I filled in the box and I counted and did all what you put before me. I don't know how many days I have, but sometimes I'll be like, Lord, I'd like to be done now. Feeling re Has anyone ever felt so weak on a day that you're just like, Lord, could you just take me? Let's get out of here. I, is that re a reality we face? Yes. And if you feel that way, don't. You are not alone. There, there are many, many folks that have gone through that, that pit. Uh, it's a pit of despair. The valley of the shadow of what? Death in Psalm 23. But let me comfort you. You know, in, <laughs> in the Lord's irony with me, sometimes I'd be like, Lord, it's enough. I'm done. You know, can we just finish? And he's like, you ain't done. Get up. And you ain't done boasting about one thing. Well, what's that, Lord? When you are weak, you are then what? Strong. Because your strength is not you. And this, let me tell you, if you haven't learned this lesson yet as a Christian, you will. At some point in your Christian experience, you're going to come to a trial that plays out every bit of strength you have. It'll bring you to your knees. You'll be like, I have nothing left. Anyone gone through that point yet? Raise your hand. Just, want, just look around. You're not alone. Is it, this is, you, you hit this point and you're just like, I'm weak. And then God comes through in some miraculous way. Just to show off a little. <laughs> you know, just just his style. He just he just pulls out this miracle out of nowhere. Out of rabbit out of the hat. Here you go. You know, you're about to lose everything and out something. No food. Don't have money for rent. Don't can't make the payment. Everything's going. And all of a sudden, an aunt that you never knew you had died and left you some money or some weird thing. I mean, or someone comes up to the door and knocks on the door. Hand you an envelope. I had this happen, by the way. One of the grace. If I'm going to boast in my weakness. I, I got to tell you that it was in a bad, we were in a bad way financially. You know, people think, such a luxurious church. Look at us. <laughs> so much money. <laughs> well, we didn't have enough for groceries or anything that day. And my wife was really discouraged. We didn't know how we were going to pay the mortgage. And, and I remember just going, Lord, I've done what you put before me. I, I don't know what else to do. If there's something I'm not doing, tell me. You know, make me, if I'm in sin, let me know. What, you, know you go through everything, don't you? Check all the boxes, make sure. Lord, if I'm in sin, if I'm... But, but I am, I, I am, I've used all what I have to, to serve you, and I'm out of, I'm out of, there's, the tank is completely empty. And it was, we had had service and our tide box had filled up so full. I say that very tongue in cheek. You know, it was like $2 that week or something. And we we're like, y you don't know, it was like, stab. I was like, Lord. And, and Wally said it was one of the best messages ever. <laughs> so glad to work for you. <laughs> now, by the way, can you complain to the Lord about your, your troubles? Yes. Okay, yes. you are allowed to all you want. Psalm 55, verse 17, I believe it's 16, 17. Evening, morning, and noon, I complained and murmured to the Lord. Not to the pastor. <laughs> Please let me teach you the scripture correctly. Not to your spouse. No, I complained and murmured to the Lord, and he heard my cry. And I like the King James, it says, and he answered. 
So I complained. That's my Monday. That's my, that's my um, well, most people that, you know, we're, they do the Monday to Friday work, and Saturday is their first day of the week, and Monday is my week out, my, my week. I take Monday off. So tomorrow, you know, this is Aloha Sunday for me. No work till Tuesday. So I'm getting ready to, and I get up Monday, I'm like, Lord, I'm a little discouraged. And we don't have the money in. Someone came to the door, this old gray-haired gentleman. Never seen him before. He knocked on the door. And he says, Are you, is this Isidoro Manzo? And I'm thinking, great, I'm being served some papers. Or I mean, no one calls it. Since I've been in Hawaii, I have had very few people say my full name. You know, I'm like, yes. This is for you. Oh, no, here we go. You know, and he, he had it behind his back. He hands me an envelope. So I look down at the envelope, you know, and now I'm already, I'm already weak. I feel crummy when there's, Lord, we have bills. I've already cried out to you. And I, and I'm, now I'm being served, probably sued for something, you know. So I open the envelope. He just handed it to me. And I'm like, I got to get it. You know, sometimes you, you, you don't even want to look because you feel so sick to your stomach. That's how I felt in that moment. But I thought, get it over with, you know, let's find that. So I, I ripped it open and I looked down. And it was a cashier's check made out to me for $10,000. I looked up. Where's the guy? I mean, I only looked down. I went straight for the, I did not, he well, maybe I hesitated. I don't know. I was, you know how it's in that moment. You don't really, time is warping. And so I open and I look, and where is he? I went out my front door. Those of you who have been to my house know there's only a steep driveway here or steps over there. And, I, and he was old, so I figured he couldn't be that fast. You know, and I'm looking. I went all the way to the edge of my little rock wall where I can see everything around. I can't find the guy. He's disappeared, he vanished. I have never seen that guy, to my recollection, with my photographic memory, ever before or ever since. I wish I'd see him again. He can come anytime, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Stop by. <laughs> come over, you know. But that day, I, 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 I was just like, Jan, oh, J I called her. She was gone. Je I seen she was, she was in Hilo with the kids. I'm like Jan, oh Jan, remember how we worried about the how are we gonna get the money for the groceries this week? Don't worry, the Lord knows. Remember when we prayed? She's like, yeah. He said, well, some old guy just came to the door and handed me an envelope, and I get to tell her how much them, you know, the check is for. She, she, she said she wept all the way home, coming from here. She cried all the way there for a different reason. <laughs> but she cried with tears of joy all the way home. Because we were going to get to pay our bills, and, and they had been stacking up. Our assistant pastor had passed away, gone to be with the Lord, and the bills had stacked up, and, the, and, the, and the, it seemed like the money had gone dry. And the Lord just went, don't worry. I'm still God. And it was cool because, you know, un unless you have to, see, John Higgins taught me this. Pastor John, he, he taught me that everybody wants a great praise report of what God has done. But nobody wants to be in the place <laughs> where they need a, m a, a true miracle to pull them out of it. It's like everybody wants to show up at prayer meeting, praise the Lord, God did this great thing. And, and they almost want to boast and outboast the other guy. Well, he did that for you. Let me tell you what he did for me. And, and the other guy, oh, well, yeah, that, well, well, let me tell you what he did for me. And, and that's great to boast in what the Lord has done. And John, he pointed this out to me as a young man. He said, everybody wants to be able to boast about what God has done. But nobody wants to be in the place where they need God to come through or it's over. They don't want that place of weakness where where it's really, truly going to be curtains. To me, the longer I've been in Christ, every time God puts me in that place where it's so bad, I get excited. My wife gets freaked. She'll tell you, I don't like this. And I'll tell her, hang in there, honey. Don't you remember the check? Don't you? And, and you know what's interesting looking back, how we can look back with hindsight, you know, they say that 2020 thing. We can look back and see how God has always been faithful. 
And maybe you're facing something bigger than you've ever faced, but let me suggest this to you. You will never face something in your Christian experience that will be greater, a greater test of faith than the sum of the things the Lord has already brought you through. I, I want to teach you this. This is why I think it's so important to remember and recall the things what the Lord has done in our lives. This is why I think boasting in the Lord is good. Because when, when I hear someone truly, when I say boasting, I mean they're just praising God. Thank God, God did this miracle for us. We were hurting and he came through with this. Or, or, the, or the brother that was homeless that said, I needed a shirt. And then this blonde lady came. Oh, that one that's walking over there. <laughs> and just had a shirt my size, you know. How did she know? Do we know? Jeff, do we know? We just, we just go, Lord, give us what you want us to share, you know. And we put the things out. And, and the, if you just take all of the times that God has come through for you, maybe keep a little journal of those miraculous things. And when you begin to face a really big trial in your life, go back and read those things and start adding them together. This 10,000 check plus the time the groceries. I do remember groceries on the front step many a time when we didn't have groceries. I specifically remember, and I know Raquel does, the mint and chip ice cream incident. She was saying, Daddy, please buy mint and chip ice cream. Honey, we don't have money for groceries, let alone $10 for a shrunk down. It's not even half a gallon anymore. They, they cheated. They, they tapered the the ice cream thing down to like, th it's less than half a gallon. To me, it's, it's robbery. I can't do that. Daddy, please, I want mint and Honey, we're just going to have to pray and ask God to come in with mint and chip. I, I told my daughter, we couldn't afford it. We couldn't even afford groceries. And we get home, and this couple dear couple comes to calls us can we come by your place we're on our way to the airport we've been here for a couple months and um we did some shopping at costco and you know we bought them both but there's only two of them so so that oh i forgot to mention we had already made our costco list what we need you know toilet paper the 18 pack we call it the 18 wheeler you know <laughs> and we had we had the toilet paper the you know necessities and so we put the necessities and raquel has written all over Mint and chip, mint and chip, mint and chip, mint and chip. You know, every border of the, of, the, of the list, you know, shopping list. And they come by. Can we come by? And we have a cooler that we bought, too, to keep some to go back and forth. Can we just give you the cooler? And I, I make this homemade kombucha tea, so I'm like, I, ne I, I need another cooler because the bottles, sometimes they get too fizzy and pop open, and then it's a mess. So I'll keep them in a cooler. And they, uh, cooler, praise the Lord, I got a cooler. And I open the cooler. They come by. They we gotta sorry. We gotta drop this and run. And what's on top? Mint and chip, the good one. <laughs> and and they say, oh, we're sorry. We took some already. It had like I grew up in a big family. I don't care if you scooped half. To, it's still they they had taken one little scoop out. Raquel's like dancing around. God heard my prayer. But see, if I add up the times he came through with the groceries, the times he's come through with the rent, the times he did that, and by the way, that $10,000, we had bills piled up that were, the collectors were starting to call about Don's stuff, and, and, and it was so nice to just get him off my back, just to catch a breath. Just a, <sighs> and you add all those things together, and you go, now, what was it I'm facing? Because it will never. I'm just, uh, just, just from experience. Can any of you older Christians give an amen that God has always been faithful, that whatever you're facing, if you added up everything he's already brought you through, that it will be not uh, all the sum of all these other times he's, he's carried you will be greater than what you're facing. Right? You remember, Dave, the reason I say this, because I read this in the Bible. David said, I'm not worried about this Philistine. God already delivered me from the lion and from the bear. When they came after my flock, remember, he's a shepherd. 
when I was out there taking care of my sheep, I had to face the lion and the bear, and God let me take them out. And this Philistine will be just like one of them. He had confidence because God had, he just added. Faced the lion, took care of him. Faced a bear, took care of him. One lion plus one bear bigger than one Philistine. Now you think I'm kooky, just tell you, but I need to tell you this because you, I'm not going to tell you some false gospel that you're going to have it easy in this life. But I will tell you that God will be faithful no matter what you face. Always faithful. And He will even when you're weak, even in your worst weakness, remember, you can boast not that you're strong, but that who will help you in that weak moment? Who will give you the strength? See, this is the part that the gospel really shines in, that we need to share with our friends that are hurting. Listen, even in our weakest time, God, that's when we feel his real touch of his power. His strength comes through. And that's what I want to leave you with today. Just remember, if you're in a bad way right now, hang in there. God's about to show off. You're in, and by the way, John Higgins, I, I can just hear his words in my head. I can hear him saying, you're in a good place spiritually. You know, when you have to have the miracle, he gets excited. He's like, I'm so excited for you. I can't wait to see what's going to happen. Because he's been around and he knows. The Bible says even when we're unfaithful, God remains what? Faithful. He will never quit his job. I know some of you call me and say, Pastor, Pastor, it's all terrible. And you're blah, 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 blah. And we should freak out. And I'm like, did God quit? If he quit, I'll freak out with you. Let's run around like chickens with our heads cut off. But, but last time I checked, God is still God. He's sitting on the throne. He's in charge. I don't have to really worry. And until he quits his job, even when I'm in a bad way or you're in a bad way, I, I, John's attitude's rubbed off on me. I get excited now. I'm like, let's wait to see the miracle because you know a faithful God will not let you down. He'll come through, and that's when you'll see strength, and that's when you'll grow. You know, we don't really grow in the times when everything is easy, when there's no pressures, no, no resistance, no... You know, they say like when you, when you body build, you have to tear the muscle down. You have to work it. You have to really put that extra plates on there to, to force the resistance to increase. And that causes a tearing down of the muscle. But then with some rest and some nutrition and a little bit of recovery time, the muscle comes stronger. That's what God wants to do with your faith. You might face some tribulation. You might face some pressure. You might feel like something's squeezing you right now. Anyone feel like that has happened to you? You just feel that squeeze, man. You're like, what? God's growing you. He's making you stronger. And that's what I want to leave you with today. May you receive his strength. When you're feeling weak, may his strength just shine to overflowing, that you would just see miracles Take place, Lord. I just pray for each person here, for all that will listen later, Lord, through the internet or the iTunes or the radio, whatever, however the message may come to them. Lord, let them hear what your spirit wants to speak to them. And we thank you, Lord, for your scriptures that we can look to, for the encouragement that they bring. Take us from this place now, Lord, reliant upon your strength, boasting in what you do, to all those that need to hear of you. We ask that together. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone that agreed with me said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? We'll sing a closing song. And Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.